Wonderful Words and Phrases is written and read by me, Albert Jack. Here are some with military origins. Once the balloon has gone up, you know there is trouble ahead. During the First World War, observation balloons would be sent high into the sky at the first suspicion of an enemy attack in order to monitor distant enemy troop movements. To most people, this was a sign of impending action. Twenty years later, during World War II, strong barrage balloons connected to the ground with thick steel cable were raised around English towns. The idea of these was to impede the enemy aircraft that might crash into them in the darkness or clip their wings on the steel cable. Often they also protected cities from enemy missiles which would hit the balloon and explode before reaching their targets. Their success was immeasurable, but to city folk the sign of the balloon going up meant an air raid was coming and trouble was indeed ahead. To call somebody a barrack room lawyer is usually a derogatory term meaning they are unqualified or inexperienced at what they are attempting to try and achieve, usually in professional circles. Well, since the 19th century, the Queen's, or King's, regulations have enabled soldiers without any formal legal training to conduct their own defence, to make formal complaints to superiors or promote their own interests. But those who did were usually held in contempt by their commanding officers who bestowed the uncomplimentary tag. The phrase had passed into common English language by the beginning of the 19th century. A basket case is a light-hearted, although not entirely affectionate, way of describing somebody who cannot communicate properly, is mentally unstable and unable to cope emotionally. Well, at the end of the First World War, the Surgeon General of the US Army was quoted in the US official bulletin on the 28th of March 1919 that he denies there is any foundation for the stories being circulated about the existence of basket cases in our hospitals. It's a clear reference to trench soldiers suffering shell shock and related mental illness. At the time, basket weaving was a regular activity in both the British and American mental hospitals, such as the one at Doolally in India. The phrase was already in common use throughout the British Army at that time, and the Americans picked it up and used it as a slang term. Now, to describe a person as having gone Doolally would suggest they have gone mad. In the late 19th century, as the British Empire dominated the world, the British Army established a military base at Doolally, 100 miles north of Bombay in India. The base had an asylum into which unstable, battle-weary troops would be sent to recover. But it also doubled as a transit camp where soldiers at the end of their duty tour would be stationed to await the boat home. But ships only left for home between November and March and so some soldiers had months to wait for their transportation. The ensuing drawn-out weeks of heat, exhaustion and boredom often resulted in strange and eccentric behaviour. This behaviour would be explained on their return to Britain as the man having had to go through Doolally. Doolally was first recorded as military slang in 1925. To imply somebody is dressed to kill is to suggest they are smart, fashionable and set out to make a romantic conquest. But the origins of this phrase appears to have come from the Cambridge Tribune, an American newspaper. On the 10th of November in 1881, an army recruit, resplendent in his new shiny uniform, was asked how he felt with his new look. Unimpressed by either the splendour of his uniform or the question, the soldier simply replied to the interviewer, I'm dressed to kill. To have bought the farm is a well-known American expression, meaning to have died. There are several suggested origins to this, one being a sentimental line in a US war film which has a character from the Midwest yearning for home and telling friends that when the war is over, he plans to return to the country, buy a farm and settle down. When the character is later killed in action, his buddy sentimentally remarks, well, I guess Joe's bought the farm now. The popularity of the film at the time ensured the phrase passed over into wider use in the States, especially during the Korean War when it was often suggested fallen comrades had bought the farm. The second and more likely origin leads us to the early days of aviation when the great pioneers were invariably rich playboys, such as Gordon Bennett who were living life on the edge of danger. If and when a plane crashed into farms or remote farmland, the estate of the deceased pilot would be held responsible for any damage and was invariably forced to pay substantial costs. Such payments would usually be enough for the farmer to redeem a mortgage or to buy the farm outright. Dead aviators were therefore often known to have paid for or bought off the farm. During the Second World War, US servicemen were all given life insurance policies worth $10,000, a great deal of money in 1940. Most young and unmarried servicemen named their parents as beneficiaries and those killed in action could also have been known to have bought their farms, using the money from the insurance payment. That expression in America is often shortened to simply, he's bought it. Some people like to believe the phrase has a religious origin on the basis that the Old Testament refers to heaven as a farm for the soul. 
A person killed, especially in the service of the good Lord, had a place in heaven and hence had bought the farm. But like I say, some people believe this, I am not one of them. To camp it up is to perform in a flamboyant or effeminate manner in an attempt to draw attention to oneself. Now quite how this phrase became applied to overt homosexuality isn't known, but it is recorded that trails or groups of civilians would follow a marching army and provide various services such as the sales of alcohol or washerwomen or male and female prostitutes. As they would also camp nearby, this could perhaps be where the associated expression camp as a row of tents comes from. D-Day must be one of the most famous words in military history. Although the D is often thought to stand for deliverance, it in fact stands for, in military parlance, for day, in the same way as H in H hour stands for hour. It is simply a way of counting down to an offensive without actually giving away the time or date, the day before D-Day, for example, being D-Day minus one, and so on. The most famous D-Day of them all, of course, was June the 6th, 1944, when Britain and her allies launched an offensive across the English Channel at the start of the campaign to free France from occupation by Nazi Germany. But this wasn't the first or only D-Day in military history. There were also a number of them during the First World War. Field orders dated 7th of September 1918, for example, read, The First Army Will Attack at H Hour on D-Day. Later in the 20th century, D-Day was used by some to signify February the 15th, 1971, the day the decimal currency was introduced into Britain. But for me, and for millions of others, there is only ever going to be one D-Day, and that's the D-Day of 1944. A die-hard supporter is resilient, fierce, and will show complete loyalty in any circumstances. The original group of diehards were the British 57th Foot Regiment in the Duke of Wellington's army who fought bravely against the French during the Battle of Albuhira. During the Napoleonic Wars on the 16th of May in 1811, their commanding officer, Colonel Inglis, had his horse shot dead from beneath him and he himself lay badly injured on the ridge that was a key position for Wellington's army. At the time, the English were badly outnumbered by French troops and under heavy attack. But even so, Inglis refused all attempts to carry him to the rear and instead lay shouting encouragement to his men. Die hard, the 57th! Die hard! I'm not sure if that sort of motivational speaking would encourage me very much, but it worked at the time and the battle was eventually won, albeit with heavy casualties as only one of 24 officers survived, along with 168 of the original 584 infantrymen. From that day onwards, the regiment, which became the West Middlesex Regiment, were known throughout Wellington's army as the Diehards. It's not recorded what the French army called the Diehards after this event, but we can guess. This has been Albert Jack reading from Wonderful Words and Phrases, with military origins.